Hi there guys, it's Mike from MCQ Bushcraft here and welcome to episode 9 of Bushcraft Basics. In last week's episode, episode 8, we had a look at some of the pathogens and contaminants that are in our water supply and really last week's episode was just designed to arm you with a little bit of knowledge so that you can approach products a bit more subjectively and start to work out different methods and systems of actually making water safe to drink. A lot of the time when you see a product you can look at the description and you can take it as gospel but what you don't actually realise is some of the reasons behind why they can say they do certain things is down to various circumstances that take place that can be fairly common but are not always possible and uh, it just gives the creator of the device a little bit of artistic license on being able to say what it can and can't do a little bit like a CV for example that someone would write for a job application you know you can take liberties on certain things and make them sound far more interesting than they really are it's that kind of mentality really in some respects that you've just got to be able to see through when you're looking at products and what they claim to do and in this week's episode we're going to be looking at a range of different products I have some products with me today uh, we have gravity filters, straws, different chemical treatment methods, even basic methods that are actually used in the field and ceramic pumps as well and hopefully these products will give a good representation of the kind of common technology that's out there that you can find on the shelf and we're really going to go through them today, discuss their pros and cons and I'll show you how to use a few of them as well in the field. The first kind of filter that we'll have a look at are uh, gravity filters and gravity filters are very popular, very simple technology. We have two different types of gravity filter here that use different styles of filtration, if you like. Uh, this one here is a very popular one and the reason they call them gravity filters, you can have a body of water above in a container and it will be drawn through the filter and clean water will come out the other end. So essentially they can be hung in campsites and used as clean water sources to go and collect water from and they can be very useful in that context. A lot of them come with containers like the Soya Mini and you can also have a straw on the end as well that goes into the container like this and you can draw water up through it so you can have an emergency supply of water that you can carry with you. But let's have a look at the Soya Mini. The Soya Mini is a very popular filter that you'll see quite a few people using in this day and age simply because it's so small, it's so light and it's got a good proven technology behind it and Soya are a reputable company. This one here can filter up to 100,000 gallons of water which is about 450,000 litres so it has a very considerable um, ability to filter an awful lot of water for you but that's provided that you look after it. Uh, this filter here is rated at 0.1 microns absolute and absolute means that it's tested under absolute conditions and it should be functioning at 100% efficiency not letting anything through 0.1 microns or above. It has no pre or post stage filtering process it's just one hollow fibre membrane filter right through from head to tail and what that means is it's just a long canal of tubes which is a very accurate technology and uh, widely used in, in the modern world today for water filtration so the water just passes through a length of tubing and any particles 0.1 microns or above would not be allowed to pass through the actual filter and they'd be caught in that hollow fibre membrane. Another important feature about filters like this, especially with hollow fibre, is they require to be back flushed um, after use. And what that means is that once you've consumed water through or contaminated water through either the bottle or directly out of a river in whichever context you're using it for, um, you need to then back flush it. And what this filter actually comes with is a tiny little plunger that you can fill full of clean water or, so, or even air if that's all you can use and you can back flush the filter and what that does is it's said to improve the life of the filter to up to 85% because effectively what you're doing with hollow fibre is you're just catching loads of particles and all those kind of small holes can be can be blocked up over time and it reduces the flow rate of the filter so by back flushing it you fire back out all those particles and actually clear those pathways for it to be used again the next time you wish to have drinking water. As we talked about this filter doesn't have any pre or post filtration methods and it has no active carbon in it so 
the actual taste of the water won't be improved. It's not going to deal with pesticides or herbicides or reduce them in any way whatsoever unless they're bound to larger particles. It's uh, not essentially going to tackle industrial compounds that might be in the water supply, again, unless they're bound to a larger particle that's 0.1 microns or above. So that's the disadvantage with a filter like this if you're in a, a part of the country or in a part of the world where they're using a lot of herbicides, a lot of pesticides, there's a lot of industrial factories around. A filter like this probably isn't the filter for you because it won't tackle those kind of contaminants that are actually in the water and reduce them enough for you for continuous safe drinking, which is a bit of a shame if they added an active carbon element to a filter like this, even a replaceable capsule that went on the end, then it would probably be far more useful in an environment like that. But that's not to say that you aren't capable of making your own by using part of a plastic bottle and screwing it on the end there, if you do have this filter. At 0.1 microns, this filter is basically going to filter out quite a lot for you, quite a lot of the pathogens that cause a problem in the modern world. It's going to deal with things like E. coli, salmonella, cholera, um, it's even going to be able to deal with the spores from anthrax. It's going to be able to deal with protozoa like Giardia and Cryptosporidium. Um, even because of its pore size, essentially at 0.1 microns, it's going to be able to handle all of those things quite happily. And it won't be able to deal with viruses, but do bear in mind that a lot of these things can bind to particles in the water, bits of feces, bits of soil in turbid waters. So if you are concerned about those kind of things then there is a possibility that a filter like this might be able to deal with the causes of some of those problems simply because it will be able to filter out larger particles that things like viruses and pollutants will bind to when they're actually in the water but I would not rely on this filter if that's a very common problem and at risk in your environment because it's simply not geared up to deal with those kind of things and also a very good point is when you're using this filter and you're drinking from fresh water, if waters are very turbid, so they're full of sediment, it's ill-advised to actually put this, this filter into the water and drink straight out of turbid waters, because you'll drastically shorten the life of gravity filters and filtration straws in that context. It's always advised that if you can pre-filter the sediment out of the water first, then do that, because you'll extend the life of the filter. This is a filter that I've been using for about the last three years and it's almost at the end of its life. And this is the Webtex inline filter. Once again, very similar to the Sawyer Mini in terms of its design, it can actually be like the Sawyer Mini, put into the lines of a camelback or water bladder system, making it quite a useful filtration system if you're on the move and you only got time to pour contaminated water into your water bladder. The filtration capacity of this one is far less than the Sawyer Mini. It can filter about 1,600 litres, which is about 350 gallons. So it can't filter nearly as much at all as this Sawyer Mini here at 100,000 gallons or 450,000 litres. But this one's a pretty robust filter and it's got some good features to it. This is uh, rated at 2 microns, so it's a lot larger than the Sawyer Mini in terms of its pore size and it's a tortuous path filter. And what that means is, unlike the filter in this one, which is a, essentially tubes, so a hollow fibre membrane, this one has a maze of infrastructure that the particle must travel through. So it has to, to go through lots and lots of little pores and canals, which essentially increases the um, ability for particles to get captured in the filter itself. One thing that Webtex say about this filter is that it contains pre and post filtration methods and also EPA media, purification media, that will outlast the, the life of the actual filter itself. Um, it doesn't actually state what that is or what it can do, or what it's designed to do, but it does go on to say that this filter will improve the taste of the water almost immediately, remove things like pesticides, herbicides, other organic matter, um, solvents from industrial waste. So it makes you believe that this filter has some kind of active carbon element to it and um, that might be the case, it's a very common thing used in filtration. If anyone's not familiar with active carbon, it's carbon that's been specially treated and um, it, it becomes highly absorbent, incredibly absorbent material 
and just for an example one milligram of active carbon can generally absorb in excess of about 500 meters squared so very absorbent stuff it's not the only thing used in water filtration it's not designed to remove microbes um, but it is designed to remove things like herbicides and pesticides and water that's been treated with chlorine will obviously instantly taste better once it's been through an, a an active carbon filter so it does make you believe that this might have an active carbon element to it it doesn't say that in any of the advertising and uh, none of the information provided out there actually points to that but it, it may be the case um, which is a good a good sort of feature on the filter really if this filter can remove things like or reduce I should say herbicides, pesticides um, compounds that are really going to be uh, considered toxic or pollutants in the water supply then um, that's a fantastic feature of the filter and I think it's one thing that this one has that the Soya Mini doesn't but in terms of the kind of things that it's going to filter out, you've got E. coli, you've got Salmonella, it's going to be able to deal with them. It's easily going to be able to do with Protozoa, which are quite large, around about 5 microns, and this is 2 microns. And it does say that it can do viral causes as well. And what I think it means by that is pieces of faeces and bits of soil, turbid waters, large particles that essentially viruses, bacteria and protozoa can bind to, even pollutants that would get caught in this filter. So it should really be able to handle everything you want it to, but again, it's not the filter for you if you live in a part of the world where viruses are a problem. You wouldn't want to rely on just this, and you might want to pair it up with something else like chemical treatment like chlorine dioxide or chlorine or iodine that could get rid of viruses or boiling water for example. So the pair of these together could should be able to tackle most things out there in a lot of different parts of the world. Other types of filters exist with similar technology inside them. This is a life straw and it's a very popular filter uh, designed for emergency aid and um, very very useful bit of equipment actually, quite small really considering what it can do and uh, worth keeping one of these or of something of a similar design actually in your kit for when you really need water. But it's safe to say that these products here can be used in a similar way. These are obviously gravity filters but they can be used as straws and Webtex design a range of filters with the same patented filter design inside just in straw devices. So in theory this straw here can actually still function as a gravity filter and I would just classify it in the same context in most in most cases simply because it works in the same way just you're sucking water through it but life straw do make one which is exactly the same as this with an adapter on the front that just works a little bit like these ones here so it can be connected up to a water source by a camp area and then this plugs taken off the bottom or and it has a small valve on the other one and water can be set free that way. So the technology is very, very similar, it's just that the cases that they're put in are designed to adhere to different markets. But Life Straw is quite a popular one and um, one of the most well-known straws that are out there. Its filtration capacity isn't as good as, as these two here in some respects. Uh, this can do 1,000 litres, which is about 264 gallons of uh, fresh water and this is a hollow membrane filter again, a hollow fibre filter and it simply just has tubes running all the way through but it does have a pre-filtration system very very basic, just a piece of foam because obviously with these straws a lot of the time you're sucking water out of turbid waters and this part here is designed to just remove the turbidity in the water and it can actually be washed as well but not too easily in, in some respects. The Webtex straw actually has a removable pre-filter in there which is cotton wool that can be taken out and replaced or washed to get rid of sediment. In this one it's a little bit more tricky than that. With a lot of these products that we've looked at this morning these are very basic filters and um, they're generally inexpensive and they feature a lot of the same technology, a lot of the same reliability and um, they're good bits of equipment to have with you out in the field if you need to filter water. The disadvantage with them is they're generally low capacity, especially if you don't look after them, and the maintenance side of them is very difficult. They can't be maintained, cartridges can't be replaced, and they can be damaged quite easily. The nice thing about these straws with the pre-filter is obviously 
you can drink straight out of turbid waters. If this water was quite flooded and muddy, which it isn't at the moment, I would use this filter by drinking straight out of it if I had to. But there's always advice there that, that says that you should collect water, filter it through a rag and then drink out of it to extend the life of your filter. This one, along with the two other gravity filters we looked at this morning, requires blowback effectively. So once you've drunk with it, which I'll drink out of this stream now, I can show you. So it doesn't take long for the water to actually start coming up through the filter. You just have to keep that pressure on but it's actually pretty heavy now. And I can feel there's a lot of water inside the filter. So what it advises you to do is to blow back through it to clear the particles and sediment out and obviously get the water out as well. So you can put it back in your kit. Easier said than done. And that's pretty much it. The only water remaining inside now is in this piece of foam at the end but you should be able to get a bit of the water out of that by just flicking your wrist there we go this life straw here although it has quite a low capacity compared to some of the other filters we've looked at today and that we will look at is still very useful and quite a reliable piece of equipment designed for aid for people who need it and uh, this is going to be able to deal with pretty much everything you're worried about out here that could be pathogenic and make you ill. So things like E. coli, salmonella, cholera. It's also going to be able to deal with anthrax spores as well. It'll be able to deal with protozoa like Giardia and Cryptosporidium. But because it has no active carbon element to it, it's not going to be able to deal with contaminants that are in the water supply from herbicides, pesticides, agriculture, and also industrial solvents. So unfortunately, another filter would be right for you if those are the things you're concerned about in your area. You've seen some of the things that the Sawyer system comes with. It comes with this bottle, we have a straw, and we have the filter, and the plunger I don't have with me in the field today, but that's very good for forcing water or air back through the filter to push out any sediment. Water's a little bit better because it's going to move things up a little bit more. But in terms of what we do with the Sawyer, very, very easy system to use and really for me just an emergency system. We've got a nice stream here, not turbid at all. Um, it comes out of rock further up. So this is a fresh spring and it's, um, it's very clear. And with water like this, I'm not too worried about things like herbicides, pesticides and contaminants. There are other places that I go which I am worried about that because they're near areas where there's a lot of farming and that I know crops are grown and I've seen them doing spraying and I know that that gets into the water supply there and I'm always very dubious about drinking water from those areas and mindful that I'm probably getting that kind of um, I suppose contamination inside my body but then we do get a lot of that from the food we eat off of the shelf anyway so it's, um, it's best to minimise it as much as you can but it is very difficult it is very difficult but this stream here is, is an ideal stream that I would drink from if I were out in the woods or the wilderness. I said in the last video I've drunk straight out of this stream and I have and I've not been ill, I've done it a few times. But I generally go much further up to where it's coming out of stone, out of a, not a wall of such but a natural wall, out of the source. And it's really clean there. On its way down there is potential that things can get in, pathogenic bacteria, protozoa from animal faeces and other contaminants as well. But in this water here, really what I would do if I was going to approach this is I'd just collect it straight with my bottle and boil it on the fire. And that's generally what I would do with a stream of this quality. Um, but if we were using the Soya Mini, for example, let's say we need some water in an emergency, it's really easy to do. You want to put a bit of air in the bottle first by blowing into it. You can always face it downstream so you can avoid sediment, but this is a very clean water. You can take your Sawyer Mini, pop it on your top there, avoid getting any water around the mouthpiece there because of contamination. You can pop the, uh, the cap off and drink. It's 
So it's not a bad system for actually getting water. It's um yeah, it's okay. I mean, I don't really, I don't really rate any of this. This is the bit that that really matters, and it can be used in other ways as well. For example, we can have a bottle here, like this Nalgene bottle, and actually squeeze the water into the bottle just like this. So once we've used this, if we had the plunger system, we could connect that to this end and actually force clean water back through the filter, flushing out all the particles. You can actually blow on it. It's not very effective because it's 0.1 microns and that's a very, very small pore size, so pushing air through that can be a bit of a struggle. But most of the water's actually come out of it. There we go. So really, you do want to carry the plunger part with you and uh, that'll probably... Uh, make life easier and, and that way you've got a bit more of a dedicated water purification system on you um, but not bad not bad if you need clean water it's a good option for you but for me it's more of an emergency piece of kit for a med kit so we've had a look at a few gravity filters and straws and those are very good budget systems to use if you're just looking for something to keep on you while you're out in the field in an emergency or if you want clean water um, a lot of the time I would use something like this as a, a permanent system for filtering water and I'd put other systems around it. Um, so this would be part of a camelback for example and then that setup would be something that I constantly use with dirty water and uh, use that to actually clean it. And the, the nice thing about a camelback as well is when you have the excess piping with some water in it you can obviously then blow that back through. If you have this on your shoulder for example a bit of piping there with clean water in because it's come through the straw. By blowing back you're putting that clean water back through the filter into the bladder and that acts as your blowback system. And that way you can maintain the filter through a system like that. And it's a little bit easier, it's a little bit more self-contained. But cleaning an actual water bladder out is another story and it does need a bit of maintenance when you're back at home and you're out of the field. Um, there are different designs though, some of them very easy to clean others a little bit trickier, some of the older ones are quite tough. But let's have a look at a ceramic pump filter because they can be quite good dedicated systems if you're always using filters out in the field to purify water. In here we have a catadin filter and catadin produce some very very good filters. You have um, Omnus as well that produce some interesting ones as well and MSR but catadin uh, makes some very very good filters. This is probably one of their better ones in terms of actual build quality, not function, believe it or not. But this is the Catadin Pocket, and it's a very robust filter, probably one of the most robust filters I've ever seen, really. Built to last, has a lifetime guarantee, and um, really is uh, an incredible bit of kit. It's all metal construction, apart from this shell here, which is a very thick plastic. A lot of people complain about that and say it should be metal, but when you're up in the mountains and you're pumping freezing cold water, this being plastic here actually keeps your hands a bit warmer and makes it more user friendly than if it was metal and it would be freezing if it was. This is a ceramic pump filter, so you'll pump it like this. It has a pre-filter on the end just here uh, for large sediment. You can see it's quite a, quite a good one actually. Um, it's a, a very fine white mesh that takes a lot of sediment out of the water. You've got a piece of foam there, a bit like a float on a fishing line to um, adjust how deep the water is effectively. So you're not taking water off the surface, which is where most of the bacteria and protozoa are. You're taking it a bit further down in, in cleaner waters. And that's the idea behind it. Quite a long tube as well. So you can get a bit of reach into the actual stream or water source you're using. But we've got the outlet pipe there. You might wonder why there's not a hose on there at the time being. It's because it's kept in a sterile bag or in a bag away from any of the other parts of the filter, simply because you don't want contaminated water getting on the outlet hose that's going to be going into your container. So it's often kept in this bag here on its own and then put on when needed. If we take this top part off here, the filter will come apart. You can see there's the ceramic filter inside. You can see we have 
bearing valves in here as well, which is a, a really nice little feature. The components on this are, are really well machined and they're very solid and this filter is cleanable. This is a 0.2 silver ceramic micron filter and um, this has no active carbon element to it, just has a pre-filter for thick sediment and then this ceramic filter here. But the thing that makes this ceramic filter different, or what, what uh, Katadin obviously talk about when they're selling this product, is that it can be cleaned. They provide you with scotch pads, just like this. And you can clean the filter up and return it back to its pale colour. And um, the filter obviously decreases in size as you do this, so they give you a measuring device. And when you put that over the filter, if it can fit perfectly over the filter, then you need a replacement because the depth of the filter isn't deep enough to guarantee that bacteria and protozoa can't get through and that's the idea behind this element here. But this filter here can do 50,000 litres or 13,000 gallons so it's got a hell of a capacity on it for a ceramic filter and uh, very well constructed. You can see this is quite thick plastic here, quite well made. I was quite impressed with this. This isn't mine. It's one I've borrowed, but uh, I have used these before. I used one of these in Norway and it was pretty good, although it wasn't really necessary because the water was very clean up in the mountains out there. Like a lot of filters, if you're dealing with turbid waters with lots of sediment, then um, pre-filtering is always advised to improve the life of the filter. But the nice thing about this one here, this sediment filter, is that if you have a bandana or a piece of cloth, it can always be wrapped around a couple of times to act as a, an even better pre-filter before it gets into the, to the ceramic filter. So that's always something that you can do with filters like this. So you can see I've uh, put the pre-filter in the river there. The float's not really doing an awful lot. The river's not deep enough really, but in deeper waters it's, uh, it's far easier. We're just going to expel about half a litre of water just to get rid of any ceramic dust. And this is a recommendation by Catadin and you have to do this with quite a lot of ceramic filters. That should do. So we can now take this spring here and clip it in the bottle and I usually pinch it between my, my legs there because it doesn't stand up too well. Once you finish pumping the water out, you can take off the outlet pipe. This will be full of clean water. I generally pop that in a top pocket, somewhere out the way, just so you're not going to get it contaminated by, by the water. Not that there's a big issue in this area here. Sometimes you can be a little bit overcautious with this sort of thing. And uh, we can just pop this down. And obviously we've got quite a bit of water. We've got 600 millilitres of water there and I was pumping the filter for probably about 30 seconds so that's not too bad. So in terms of what this filter is going to be able to do for you, what it will do, what it can't do, um, it's going to be able to take out pathogenic bacteria out of the water and it's also going to be able to take out protozoa, so things like uh, Giardia and Cryptosporidium, E. coli, Salmonella, Cholera, also anthrax spores as well. So anything in terms of, you know, the, the worry around pathogens is really neutralised by a filter like this. It's going to be able to do quite a lot for you out in the field. It's very robust, so it's for long-term use. If you carry a spare filter, then obviously you've got something that will last you a very, very long time. Uh, downsides are it's quite big and heavy and there are smaller filters around that can actually have a bigger capacity and are simpler to use. Um, but it really depends on what you're looking for. This is really a long-term filter and um, quite a good one as well, lifetime guarantee, very solid. But what it won't do for you, it has no active carbon element to it. It can't remove things like industrial solvents, pesticides and herbicides and other sort of pollutants from the water supply. So if that's a problem for you, this isn't the filter for you because you're only going to have to run it through an active carbon filter to actually get rid of that and it means you'd need another filter in the field with you. 
Um, so not not really a, a sort of um, jack of all trades in in that respect. I think the Katadin Combi is a better filter than this. It's cheaper and it has a ceramic filter, but on the inside of that it has active carbon, and that will actually take out herbicides, pesticides industrial solvents and other toxins from the actual water supply, other organic compounds that are in the water. So that's actually a better filter than this one if you're worried about herbicides and pesticides. But uh, again, this filter is not geared up for things like um, viruses. There are special filters out there that are cheaper than this actually that will deal with viruses. Um, one of the Sawyer ones is much cheaper than this and that will deal with viruses for you and is designed for virally high waters so it might be a better option for you to look at um, but if the virus is bound to a piece of soil or a particle then this filter here will obviously capture that particle and stop the virus going any further if it remains on the particle but not a filter designed for for use in viral waters unfortunately we've got a range of chemicals here and this is certainly not all of them there's a very broad range of chemicals out there used to disinfect water and some are more effective than others and it really depends on cost and a number of other things and whether, the, whether they get issued and who they get deployed to. But one thing that's missing from here, one of the main ones, or the, the, the most common three I call them, is iodine, which we'll talk about at the end. But we have chlorine here, which is a very common way of disinfecting water. We also have chlorine dioxide, which is a far more efficient way of disinfecting water. And we have neutralising tablets, and neutralising tablets are designed to go with the chlorine and they make the water more palatable, so they effectively take away that swimming pool taste and smell of the actual water, which isn't too pleasant when you want to have a lot of water and rehydrate yourself. But let's talk about chlorine dioxide first, because it really relates back to chlorine and iodine. Chlorine dioxide tablets are available from a range of companies really that they put their branding on. This is Life Systems and Life Systems come in this little box. They're quite nice actually, protects the tablets and uh, we've got up to 30 litres of water, um, treatable 30 litres of water in this container here. And chlorine dioxide is probably the better side of water treatment with chemicals when you're out in the woods and you're carrying tablets like this. Um, it's, uh, it's really protozoa that's a problem when you're talking about things like iodine and chlorine and, and chemical treatments of water. Um, iodine, not very good for long-term use, has adverse effects on the human body and it's not very effective at all at dealing with cryptosporidium. It's moderately effective or low to moderate effect on Giardia but not particularly good at dealing with cryptosporidium and not good for long-term use either. It usually comes in droplets or in tablet form. You have chlorine as well, which is a far more common method of treating water. Again, not particularly good at treating protozoa. It has sort of low to moderate effects on Giardia and not very effective at all at dealing with Cryptosporidium. Iodine and chlorine are both very effective at dealing with bacteria and viruses. So this is why I talked about earlier about pairing up something like chlorine or iodine with a water filter. Not this one really in particular, but perhaps the Catadin one or some kind of soya filter or an MSR filter or Optimus filter. If you were going to a country where viruses were to be a problem and the waters were very heavily pathogenic with bacteria, perhaps you can't boil water because you're not allowed to make a fire in that particular national park or it's at risk at making fire because it's a very hot, dry country and very windy then something like this can, that you keep in your med kit can really get you out of a situation where you need to disinfect the water and make sure there's no viruses and the bacteria is completely dead as well. But if you are going to go with tablets, I would recommend chlorine dioxide as a, as a far better way to go. Its effects against protozoa are far better than iodine and chlorine. Uh, chlorine dioxide is, is far more effective at dealing with Giardia and it's a little bit better at dealing with Cryptosporidium. I wouldn't say it was 100% because it isn't, and, um, but it's just more effective at dealing with Cryptosporidium. Um, so you've got a far better, better chance really of getting purified water if you're combining methods like this or you've just got this, for example. 
but again very good at dealing with bacteria and viruses. I would always keep these in my med kit if I was travelling abroad to a country where I was suspect about water and unsure about what I was going in for to deal with. So we've had a look at a range of technologies and their limitations and what they can do, what they can't do. And a lot of the products we've looked at today represent almost like a, a common standard that you find out there on the shelves of the most common products that you get. And just having a bit of a basic understanding about what's in the water and what can actually filter it out or neutralise it allows you to then look at filters in a new light. I've met people who have gone out and spent a huge amount of money on a catadin pocket and they think it's doing everything. They think it's removing herbicides, pesticides, contaminants and all sorts of things out of the water. And then until you talk to them about it, they realise that they were wrong and the filter doesn't actually do everything they thought it did. Um, and that they just bought it thinking that because it was so expensive and um, well made that it was doing everything um, when really a cheaper filter could have done more than that for them anyway for them. But for wilderness expeditions, a filter like that is very good, obviously. But also knowing how to pair products up together. If you have med kits on you in your packs, you're traveling into the wilderness or you're going abroad to countries you're unfamiliar, you know, unfamiliar with and what their water quality is like. Having some tablets, some chlorine dioxide tablets, having a water filter, maybe a small one like a Soya Mini inside your med kit can ensure that you have safe drinking water. So you can understand how you pair those products up to produce safe drinking water for you, especially if you can't make a fire. Obviously fire is one of the best ways of disinfecting water. Um, we did talk about it in last week's episode. There are bacterium that aren't killed at 100 degrees C at boiling point, but it's incredibly rare to encounter them and you wouldn't have to worry about them if you're out in the wilderness. But boiling water is probably the most efficient way of disinfecting water but it comes with its pros and cons if you're moving through a lot of territory you don't want to be stopping all the time and boiling water is something that you can do quite happily around a camp and something like this is very useful alongside boiling water and those kind of basic skills you use in the field and this here is a millbank bag and millbank bags are sort of like glorified rags really used for taking sediment out of water. So I've placed the millbank bag in this stream here and this stream is pretty shallow. You can see that can be a bit of a disadvantage with a system like this because deeper waters it's far easier to use it in. You've really got to squeeze it, get all the water soaked into the canvas. You can disturb the, uh, the bed of the water and uh, get lots of mud everywhere but that's not really a problem as this system will obviously get rid of that like it's designed to. But when you're trying to fill it up, it can be difficult in shallow waters because you really want to be filling it past this line to the top. But you can see I've only filled it up part of the way. So if you have a steel container, you can assist the millbank bag. And you may think, but I'm contaminating my container. Well, if the water's going to be boiled in this container anyway, then it's not going to be contaminated. So it's pretty easy to fill up. This is why metal containers are quite versatile and useful. And this system goes together quite well. So once we've filled this up, we essentially hang it like this. And you'll see that there's a line just here. And this line is when we can actually start putting the water into a container, because obviously there's quite a lot of muddy water, or there would be if the water was turbid on the outside of this. And it would be all running down the bag and going to the bottom. So the, the idea is that when the water gets to this line, all the water on the outer shell of the millbank bag is gone, and it's just the water coming out of the bag now. So you can hang these up from a tree going into a pot and it will take all the turbidity out of the water. So it's pretty much just a glorified rag or a sock uh, getting rid of sediment and that's it. So once you've filled up your container with the millbank bag, it should be sediment free, which this is. And all it requires is boiling and that sterilizes the water, it disinfects it and uh, 
it's safe to drink and that's a method that a lot of people use. Obviously bacteria, pathogenic bacteria, protozoa is killed and is no longer a problem. Viruses are killed, no longer a problem. Um, majority of bacteria anyway, as we said, some aren't killed by a boiling point, but very, very rare. Um, but pesticides, herbicides and, and other sort of compounds as such, toxicity in the water is still there. And a lot of it will still be there as a, a 100 degrees C is generally not the, um, the melting point of a lot of these things. So that is something that you have to contend with if you want to choose these more simpler methods and rely less on technology if you're out exploring areas. But it really depends on what kind of environment you're in. I'm quite happy just filtering with something like a millbank bag or a rag into a steel container and boiling. And when I'm on the trail and I'm moving quickly, a water bladder with three litres of water in and a filtration system as backup is pretty much all I need. And I don't ever really have any problems for that. I'm, I'm not massively keen on the millbank bag, I must say. I, I think um, it's great around a, a camp and it's pretty good for removing turbidity in water. But it really depends on what kind of water sources you're, you're dealing with a lot of the time. If you're, a lot of the water sources I deal with don't have a huge amount of turbidity in, even at the worst times of the year. So something like this has never been something I've turned to, but if you're in a part of the country where the water runs very, very brown after rainy days, then a millbank bag might be the ideal option for you. It's, uh, it's really dependent on the individual's experiences. So I hope this video's helped out and provided just a little bit of clarity on the technologies that are out there and what they can deal with. And hopefully you'll join me in next week's episode where we'll be having a look at knife law. Because obviously to be able to make a fire and sterilize water, you're gonna wanna be able to use a knife a lot of the time to be starting to process wood. And uh, knives are quite a crucial part of equipment. But understanding the law behind them in the British Isles is another story and something you really need to know if you're going to carry a knife in a bushcraft kit. So join me next week on episode 10 where we'll look at knife law. But for the time being, have a look at the links in the description to various products and um, obviously other things out there that can better educate you on the sort of things that are in the water and what products can do what and other videos as well that can help. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next week on Bushcraft Basics. Take care, guys.